Okay, so hello everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. And thank you especially to our speakers, Tony Donet, Omar Hurricane, and Dennis White for accepting our invitation to this event. I'm Matteo Barbarino. I work at the International Atomic Energy Agency and we work to foster collaboration and coordination on fusion R&D and move forward in developing the peaceful use of fusion energy. And we've, we've been doing this work since 1958. This webinar series, starting today, will give an overview of the most recent groundbreak groundbreaking results in the fusion R&D to understand how such progress brings fusion energy closer to realization. Uh, this first episode features the JET Tokamak, the National Ignition Facility, and the Spark Tokamak. As you probably know, 2021 was an amazing year for fusion. Uh, in August, the NIF reached a record-breaking 1.3 megajoules of output, achieving for the first time a burning plasma state. In September, MIT and Commonwealth Fusion Systems announced the successful demonstration of a record-breaking 20 Tesla magnetic field in their first of a kind superconducting magnet. Uh, this is again a major breakthrough in the design of their Spark uh, device. And then in December, uh, the JET Tokamak reached the highest sustained energy pulse ever and a record-breaking 59 megajoules of sustained fusion energy. We're going to hear about these three groundbreaking results. The format will be a sequence of three talks, 30 minutes each. Please type your questions and comments into the chat box and we'll go through those during the 30 minutes Q&A at the end. So without further ado, please welcome Professor Tony Donet, CEO of Eurofusion. Thank you very much. Um, I think you can all hear me and see the screen, so um, uh, very good. So thank you very much for this uh, invitation of this uh, very, very interesting um, seminar. And I'm really delighted with uh, sharing this uh, webinar with another number of excellent uh, speakers. Um, well, JET is uh, really uh, the collaboration of a large team of people, and I want to uh, especially acknowledge the people which are here on the screen, uh, Lauren Horton, who was the uh, JET expectation manager, the team of uh, task force leaders and deputies, and uh, about 300 people from all over Europe which have been involved in the, in the experiment. So it's really big teamwork, and I'm, I'm just a messenger uh, in a sense. Um, so, why don't my, okay. Um, before I come to the JET results, uh, a few words about Eurofusion, what we are, and, and one slide on the European Fusion Roadmap that I can put everything in perspective, but then I really focus on, on JET, on the Eater Like Wall, on the first results of the recent campaigns with deuterium tritium and full tritium, and also what does this mean for ITER? Uh, so let's go to your fusion. We are a consortium of 30 national research institutes and 152 universities to be exact in 28 countries. We were very proud that also the Ukraine is part of this, and we are very worried, of course, what is happening at the moment in Ukraine. We involve uh, roughly 700 PhD students, 100 MSc students all over Europe, and 4,000 fusion researchers are involved in the work. And uh, also, JAD is really an international device. Uh, as I said, um, it's about 300 people working together. Here you can see them making up the logo. This was uh, taken uh, before the pandemic, so without any face masks, uh, but anyhow, the people are too small to recognize. On the fusion roadmap, uh, where our idea is to get to the fusion power plant, uh, the most important devices are ITER and uh, DEMO. ITER will show that fusion is feasible, uh, but will not deliver electricity. That will be done by, by DEMO. You can see that they're somewhat uh, time-faced. And at this very moment, we're doing a lot of research in present day developments, which, which in, uh, in present day facilities, which include um, uh, JAT, but also other tokamaks. Uh, we're doing a parallel work in stellarators. We're working on the materials, but I'm not going to bother you with this. 
The important element is that uh, present day devices, including JET, give very important input to ITER. So now let's uh, start talking uh, what we're here for. Uh, that's JET and the ITER like wall. And in principle, in uh, 2004, we took the decision to change the uh, wall of, of JET from carbon. Uh, to uh, to full metal, in principle, a brilliant first wall and a tungsten uh, diverter. And uh, the reason was that we realized that um, uh, carbon is not a good material for a fusion reactor. And we did this uh, complete overhaul of the machine uh, in a period of two years with only using uh, remote handling and robotics, which already was a very nice test for a device like ITER where you definitely cannot go into the device uh, once, once you have been using it at, at high fusion power. So at JET, um, uh, it's very important that it's the machine which at the moment and, and still is closest in size to ITER, it's the largest operating tokamak in the world. It has the same plasma facing materials as, as ITER. And it's the only tokamak in the world which can operate with deuterium tritium fuel. So uh, this is this is really a very important. Uh, what we realized in the early 2000s is that um, a carbon, uh, although an ideal experiment, uh, uh, ideal material in a tokamak, has a number of important drawbacks. One is that it binds with with uh, hydrogen and so also with deuterium and tritium. And the second is it forms dust. And um, the uh, simulations which were done uh, in the early 2000s showed that if you uh, operate uh, ITER with a carbon wall, you would be able, able only to run ITER for uh, typically 100 discharges, and then you would reach your tritium safety limit because all the tritium would be bound to the carbon and lying as dust on the surface of uh, on the bottom of, of, of ITER. So this was a reason to change to beryllium and tungsten, which now, uh, let's say, brings ITER in a condition where it can operate for multiple years, uh, uh, typically 10,000 discharges before you reach the tritium safety limit. So we uh, wanted to bring it all together. We changed the wall uh, that was done, as said, in, in uh, 2010, 2011. And uh, already in the first experiments, we showed uh, have shown that that the uh, retention of of uh, hydrogenic isotopes, so especially deuterium, to the beryllium and tungsten is much less than in carbon. But we also noted that it's much more difficult to operate a machine um, uh, because the tungsten has a tendency to migrate into the plasma. It dilutes the plasma, it leads to disruptions, it leads to plasma, which are not that good anymore. So we really needed to find new recipes, new scenarios, how to operate the machine. And that took really a lot of time. But let me now take you through the results. Um, the new jet wall has led to a very strong reduction in the fuel trapped in the wall. And uh, well, the text says uh, more than 10 times. I think if you really look at the graphs, it's in the order of almost 20 times less uh, tritium retention, uh, which is very good news for ITER. And this is basically why we installed the, uh, the ITER-like wall. Uh, then uh, the uh, fusion performance, um, uh, as said, that was very difficult to achieve. And, and for instance, the uh, the graph here shows the gray data with the old carbon wall, where in 1997 we had record performance, and um, the data which we had until 2014, so in the early years of JET, where we really run into problems. Uh, so for low power, it worked reasonably well, but at some point, then the tungsten comes into plasma and you get this kind of saturation. And uh, we have been working on recipes to overcome that. And one is uh, to have seeding of the, um, of the plasma, so to have a kind of, of neon or argon blanket around the jet plasma. Uh, the second is also applying um, uh, central heating to flush the uh, the tungsten out, 
And also we could use elms, which are often seen as a uh, well negative effect to flush uh, part of the tungsten out. And uh, then in more recent years, and I would say until the end of 2019, early to 2020, we got back uh, to the uh, previous scaling with, with the uh, tower wall. So we were more or less ready then to do the final proof of the pudding uh, to uh, load jet with deuterium tritium and do the experiments. And what is very good is uh, 25 years have passed uh, since the previous experiment, which is a long time, but that really also uh, gave us all the time to improve the diagnostic system. So we got uh, better diagnostics, uh, uh, more, uh, uh, let's say, uh, measurement cords, higher spatial resolution, higher temporal resolution, and also new diagnostics specifically focused on, for instance, the neutrons, uh, the alpha particles and the gammas. At the same time, we have been also upgrading our, our theoretical and, and uh, numerical models. And this means that our um, uh, capability to predict uh, the discharges has been uh, enormously enhanced. Now, let me take you through the DT results. So, of course, uh, important is to see what is the impact of the fuel mass on the plasma properties. Um, we have been looking into novel heating methods. I will show a little bit about that. Uh, alpha particles, about the validation of the models, and also what this means for, for ITER and what well, ultimately the fusion energy production. So, um, yeah, how does the fuel mass uh, influence uh, basically the plasma properties? So, uh, chemically, uh, hydrogen, deuterium, and tritium are, are, let's say, rather similar, but of course, they, they mainly differ in mass. But does it really have an effect on the plasma? Yes, it does have. Uh, for instance, uh, what we immediately noted is that the, um, the uh, energy threshold, the power threshold, to get into the high confinement mode um, is lower. So here you can see the, uh, the threshold as a function of plasma density, where you clearly can see if you go from deuterium to a 50-50 deuterium tritium uh, mixture or even a full tritium plasma, that uh, essentially the threshold is about 30% lower. So again, this is very good news for, for ITER uh, because it means you need less power to get in the high confinement mode. Important was also to see what, what happens with these uh, different isotopes and does it really influence the plasma transport properties. And well, also this graph shows a little bit on how we have improved our diagnostics. Uh, please note this is not the complete jet uh, uh, plasma radius, it's just the last 20 centimeters, so including the separate tricks in the scrape buff layer. And shown here are measurements of the electron temperature and density taken with our high resolution Thomson scattering system. And what you see is going from deuterium to uh, via a 70 30 percent deuterium tritium mixture to 30 70 percent tritium. So tritium rig plasma. You can see an increase in the electron density where uh, the main change is in, in the pedestal area. but in essentially in the in the overall temperature profile and the in the uh, pedestal you don't see we didn't have these data in 1997 where we did the experiment so this really gives a lot of new insights which really help us to better understand what's going on what we also noted is that uh, because tritium is about one and a half times more heavy than deuterium that the erosion by the inner wall is a little bit higher than um, uh, with a pure deuterium plasma. Um, but still, the increase in the erosion by the tritium is, is uh, uh, noticeable, but it's still within the tolerance. It's not a nuisance, and we still can well cope with it. And on the new heating method, which I mentioned, is that, um, of course, because of the beryllium wall, we always have a little bit intrinsic beryllium in the plasma as an impurity. It's not much, but um, instead of uh, beryllium being a nuisance, you can also make uh, a use of it in a positive way. Uh, so in um, uh, our ion cycloton uh, group, we uh, developed now a technique to do minority heating on the beryllium. 
Uh, so the beryllium actually is um, uh, pumped up to very high energy and then uh, in collisions it gives the energy away to the, uh, the plasma and thus heating the, the deuterium tritium plasma. So this is also a very nice achievement which of course is also for ITER good news because ITER for sure will also have beryllium in the plasma and you can use similar tricks. Um, we have chosen deliberately to focus on the five second discharges and not to try to, and I will come back to that later, not try to, let's say, get a very high power in a, in a short time, uh, because the five seconds are uh, basically um, uh, long enough uh, compared to the energy confinement time, which in jet is typically between half a second and one second. So. A five second discharge is already long uh, um, because it's, it's, it's a longer time than any of the plasma physics processes. Uh, but the longer time gives you also better possibility in looking into the detailed uh, interaction of the alpha particles, for instance, with the plasma. And here you can see uh, interaction between the, um, the uh, alpha particles. So you can see the fusion power is the curve and these, uh, these uh, lines here. I'm not sure whether you can see my cursor, but it's the uh, high pitched ringing uh, of the plasma. So this is really interaction of the plasma uh, uh, of the alpha particles with, with uh, modes in the plasma. Uh, then, of course, I said we, we have been, uh, let's say, working on, on modeling and we did modeling calculations already uh, many years ago. And, and in principle, these model, model calculations were done by uh, Geronimo Garcia back in 2019. And now we have overlaid our data and you can see the data exactly follow uh, the outcome of the model. So this is, this is really good. Uh, we are very happy with this uh, validation. Because the same models predict um, also that ITER will achieve 500 megawatt at 50 megawatt input. Uh, so uh, this is also very important news for ITER because I should say that all the, um, the modeling which has been done uh, in the past for ITER was based on the uh, old uh, carbon data which were taken uh, with JET and also of course uh, data from other machines. But it was important to now have also a validation with machine uh, with a machine with deuterium tritium and having the beryllium and and uh, wall and the tungsten diverter. So coming now to the record, and this is the uh, the picture you have seen probably many times. These are the old records from 1997, where at the one hand we had well 16 uh, megawatt for really a fraction of a second. And uh, we had uh, a five second pulse at on, on average four to four, four and a half uh, megawatts, so totally uh, 22 megajoule. And as said, we really wanted to focus on the longer pulse um, because that gives the best uh, um, input um, uh, to all the physics. The five seconds, by the way, comes from the fact that the uh, jet has uh, copper coils, um, which are inertially cooled. Uh, so we need uh, some time after every discharge. So if, if we, when we really operate at high performance, we only can go to five seconds. The coils get too hot and we need to stop and wait uh, some time for the next shot. Uh, so. Uh, I really expect that superconducting devices, they of course can go to much longer pulses, but JAD doesn't have that possibility, not at the highest power. So here you can see the um, uh, the DT power, which we did in a 50-50 mixture, uh, which is already much better. So it's almost double the, uh, the world, previous world energy record. Uh, so this is um, already a very nice achievement. Uh, and this is the uh, present uh, uh, best pulse we have, uh, which is 59 megajoule. Um, to be fair, this was done in a tritium-rich plasma. It was in a, a 30, 70 uh, um, a percent deuterium tritium plasma. Um, but you can see a very nice performance. Um, we in totally created this 59 megajoule with only a minute amount of, of fuel. So um, what I've been uh, explaining in, in the meantime, many times to journalists, 
And they asked me, well, what does it mean 59 megajoule? And well, then I think one journalist came up with the idea that, well, it's about 60 kettles of water you bring to boil. Um, well, it's, it's, it's great, it doesn't say much, but we brought this to boil with only 170 microgram of uh, deuterium and tritium, 100 microgram tritium, 70 micrograms of deuterium, which is a minor amount. And if you want to do that with fossil fuel, you would need typically four kilograms of peat. So uh, to come towards a conclusion. Um, so we we have uh, prepared uh, suddenly a, a new generation also of scientists and engineers. Uh, uh, the previous DT uh, campaign was in 97 and many people which were involved at that time, they are slowly getting older. So some have left already the team. So it was important also to train new people to work with tritium, to know how all the uh, active gas handling systems work, et cetera. What was important is to test DT in ether-like conditions, ether-like, so with the beryllium-like wall and a machine as big as possible as, as ether. We got a lot of data on, uh, uh, let's say, the, the uh, burning plasma physics. Uh, we have a list of about 60 uh, papers which we will submit in the coming year to peer-reviewed journals. We are planning a special issue of nuclear fusion on, on the JET results. Important is that we validate the models uh, to extrapolate to, to ITER and any, any machine beyond. So the models are correct and and show that ITER will work. And well, actually the fusion energy record was not our main goal. It's always nice to have a world record. And uh, this is what resonates with, with journalists and with the public. But for us, the most important was the, the science which we could do and which we will do now in the coming year. Now we really are going to, to digest all the data. Uh, just uh, to, to end my talk, um, we will, uh, release a movie uh, on the story behind the DT campaign. And uh, actually the uh, premiere is, is next week. Uh, uh, I think only the date has changed from the 30th to the 31st of March. And uh, that really gives nicely the story behind the uh, DT campaign. It's a 50 mini, a minute video and, and showing how we went from all the beginning of the DT campaign to the end. Uh, some of the drawbacks we had if we run into a, when we ran into a water leak all the way to let's say the final final discharges and uh, this is basically a list of all the people so very often it's thought that uh, jet is uh, situated in the uk and it's a uk experiment no it's a machine which is operated by the uk for your fusion and it's basically a machine which brings in all the European uh, laboratories, um, which which basically uh, together are working to uh, create uh, ultimately electricity from fusion. So thank you very much uh, for the attention, and I'm looking forward to your questions uh, later on during this uh, webinar. I will unshare now the screen and give it back to you, Matteo. Thank you, Tony. Wonderful. Uh, there are some questions, and we'll get to those in the uh, in the Q and A. And I look forward to watching the movie. <laughs> okay, <Thank> so... you. <laughs> okay. Now, please welcome Dr. Omar Hurricane, uh, Chief Scientist for the Inertial Confinement Fusion Program, the Science and Physics Division at the Lawrence Livermore National Lab. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, super. All right, so uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. Uh, like uh, the work at JET and at ITER, there are a large number of people involved in our effort. I've tried to list a subset of them here on this slide. Of course, uh, there are about uh, 150 people listed here who were recently directly involved in this work, but there have been uh, over, over a thousand uh, involved in, in the lead up to uh, what we're talking about today. 
Uh, so again, I'm Omar Hurricane. Uh, I work closely with Annie Kreitcher, who uh, is the lead designer for the work I'm going to be talking about today. Alex Zilstra, who was the lead experimentalist, and Debbie Callahan. She was the uh, co-lead with me on developing the strategy and uh, and some of the empirical and, and uh, theoretical models behind this work. And so what we're discussing is uh, achieving uh, the loss in criteria uh, for ignition in inertial confinement fusion experiment. And uh, so let's get into that. So back in the uh, 1960s, shortly after uh, Theodore Maiman uh, developed the laser, uh, people from laboratories like mine uh, envisioned uh, that you could use a laser to create micro explosions, micro fusion explosions uh, based on what they were learning uh, on the, uh, the the nuclear defense side of things. <clears throat> and uh, that work was pretty much classified until the 1970s, at which time uh, a fairly famous paper came out in 1972 where uh, it was discussed that you could use lasers to directly compress matter to super high densities for thermonuclear applications. That's illustrated in this image on the right. You envision a microscopic scale uh, capsule filled with fusion fuel. You blast the outside surface of that fuel with the laser and uh, you cause the surface to explode and the equal an opposite reaction causes the uh, the capsule to compress. We call that configuration an implosion, and an implosion is the principal uh, concept behind ICF, which uh, you're using the implosion to squeeze the fuel and obtain high temperature and density. And today, this this direct what we call direct drive of uh, shooting the lasers directly at the capsule is the primary focus of colleagues at the uh, LLE and University of Rochester uh, Laboratory. So uh, back then, uh, they weren't allowed to discuss what they really had in mind. Uh, that uh, and the the idea was actually to use indirect drive, where instead of shooting uh, the lasers directly at the capsule, you can find the uh, capsule inside a metal can. You shoot the lasers at the metal can, and you create a bath of X-rays, and then you use the X-rays to drive the capsule inwards upon itself. And there are certain pros and cons to each approach. Uh, so what we we do in in our approach is uh, the lasers enter through apertures at the top of this metal can. We call this metal can a hallram, which is a German word for uh, for hollow room. It becomes an X-ray converter. The laser light uh, has a certain frequency. It's absorbed uh, near the critical surface where the plasma frequency matches the laser frequency, or nearly so, uh, sometimes a quarter of that value. That uh, energy from the laser is absorbed, uh, the atoms radiate, and you get a bath of X-rays flying in all directions, but in particular hitting the surface of the capsule, when we call that the, uh, the ablation front. Uh, the absorption of that X-ray energy causes that uh, surface to ablate, basically absorb the energy, ionize and explode. That creates a pressure on the outside of the capsule and that drives uh, the rest of the capsule with the fusion fuel inside inwards upon itself. So the ablation pressure uh, that's developed as a result of seeing these X-rays is a function of the atomic number uh, and atomic uh, weight of the material that the ablator is made of. Uh, the radiation temperature uh, of the uh, of the uh, X-rays inside the holram, and uh, there's a, a degradation. Uh, uh, of of that pressure due to the rejection of that some uh, X-ray energy in the form of the albedo of the surface. So typically in our experiments, uh, we develop uh, pressures of 100 to 200 megabars or million atmospheres of pressure on the outside surfaces of our capsule. Okay, so as we are are doing this process of delivering laser energy into this hall ROM and then to the capsule, we actually are losing energy uh, pretty significantly in each of these steps. Uh, but we, what we're doing is actually we're trading that energy away for energy density. And the whole purpose of, a, uh, of an implosion is actually to uh, act as a pressure amplifier. So again, here's our cartoon of, of the configuration where we have laser en uh, energy entering 
through these apertures, which we call laser entrance holes. The X-ray bath is, is generated around this capsule. And then if you were to take a cutaway of this capsule, here's the ablator on the outside. You have the fusion fuel uh, layered on the inside of that capsule. Uh, the laser energy entering in our experiments in, into the hall ROM is about 1 to uh, 1.9 megajoules of energy. It's uh, blue light. Uh, we call it 3 omega, uh, 351 nanometer wavelength. As we said on the previous slide, that X-ray energy causes the ablator to explode, generating uh, uh, several hundred a million atmospheres of pressure. That pressure then drives that capsule inwards upon itself, and uh, eventually it runs out of place to go. There, there's no place else to go. So that kinetic energy that's acquired as it accelerates under this pressure uh, then gets turned into internal energy uh, as, as the plasma kind of collides in on itself. At that moment, uh, you've generated uh, several hundred billions of atmospheres of pressure as you trade that kinetic energy for internal energy. But as you go through these chain of events where you go from the X-ray energy to the X-ray absorbed by the outside of the ablator to the conversion of that kinetic energy into internal energy of the fusion fuel, you give up several decades of energy at each step. So you go from 1.9 megajoules uh, of laser energy to a couple hundred kilojoules of X-ray energy absorbed to only 10 to 20 kilojoules of energy that makes it into the fusion fuel. So it's actually very energy inefficient but you again traded away energy for for pressure, and and that's again the key the key uh, use of an implosion uh, because there's such a dramatic loss of energy uh, through each step. We have different metrics for uh, for progress uh, in terms of energy, and these are uh, called gains. Uh, so uh, for um, the uh, target, you have a uh, a measure of how much fusion yield you get out compared to the laser energy you put in. So we call that target gain. Uh, when you look at the capsule, there's energy out compared to the energy absorbed by the capsule. We call that capsule gain. And then finally, for this last step, you just have the fusion fuel and there's the energy out compared to the energy uh, delivered to the fusion fuel. And we call that fuel gain. So you have to be aware there are several different definitions of gain and they all have different meanings because of this. Uh, significant loss of energy as the implosion proceeds. Okay, so uh, these type of experiments uh, are mostly carried out at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Labs National Ignition Facility. This is a facility that's about the size of three football fields, but because of this uh, nature of implosions, uh, while the facility is huge, the actual fusion experiment is on the scale of two millimeters. So there's just a dramatic a uh, difference in scale between the facility and our fusion plasma itself. Uh, so uh, what you're seeing here are the capacitor banks outside the, the main laser bays, preamplifiers, the main laser bay, uh, the switch yard, which redirects the laser beams to the target chamber. The target chamber is shown here on the right. The scale is about 10 meters diameter. The target that is inside of that target chamber is one centimeter in scale. That's the hall ROM seen here on the lower right with some cooling arms attached to it. And then inside of that is our capsule of fusion fuel, which is only about two millimeters in diameter. So while many of us who work in this area are interested in fusion energy, uh, National Ignition Facility is not an energy research facility. Its primary mission is national security. We're paid uh, by uh, the national security branch of our government. And so that's, uh, that's our primary job. Okay, so uh, this implosion again is trying to uh, create energy density, and uh, that's because we're trying to create some uh, very extreme conditions in order to stop alpha particles uh, from the DT fusion reaction inside this this rather tiny uh, fusion plasma. Uh, we're doing that because we're trying to utilize this nature of the DT fusion reaction, where essentially the reaction rate goes up as a function of temperature. And if we can trap the heat that's generated from the fusion, uh, that we can increase the temperature. And if we increase the temperature, that increases the reaction rate. And if we can trap that heat, we get more temperature and we can increase the reaction rate again. So that's the process we're trying to leverage. 
uh, essentially for our designs on NIF, uh, we're trying to trap 70 to 80% of the alphas in what we call the hot spot, which results in the temperature increasing. And the hot spot, it, just by its name, it's the hot part of the plasma, but it tends to be a lower density than the surrounding cold fuel. Uh, the, the 20 to 30% of alpha particles that are not stopped in the hot spot are actually used to ablate uh, that fusion fuel from the inside out. And that adds to the mass of the hot spot as the fusion proceeds. The typical scale of this fusion plasma is about 100 uh, microns diameter. So if that doesn't mean anything to you, 100 microns is about the diameter of a human hair. So uh, the conditions we need now to get this alpha heating uh, feedback uh, is a uh, aerial density. Uh, we talk, call it rho r. You'll hear me say rho r a lot of about 0.3 grams per centimeter squared. A peak central density of over 100 grams per centimeter squared in this hot spot. And again, the pressures are several hundreds of gigabars, which is uh, billions of atmospheres, about twice, uh, more than twice the pressure at the center of the sun. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the energy balance. In order to get these conditions, we, we really have to delicately balance all these different processes in our plasma uh, to get interesting things to happen. So this is a, a, a image uh, from a simulation uh, shown on the left. On the left part of this image, you see kind of what we expect to be the typical configuration of what we call the shell of the implosion. It's a mixture of the what's left of the ablator and the fusion fuel at peak compression. We'd like it to be perfectly round like the drawings I showed uh, previously, but in reality it's not, and the simulations pick up some of that. On the right side of that image, um, there, this uh, shows uh, the temperature. So again, it's hot in the middle, cooler at the edge. And there are some key physics processes that are competing with each other in order to uh, get uh, the pressure and temperature amplification that we see. Uh, of course, the, the primary process that we're interested in is alpha heating, where you stop these alpha particles and, and uh, get that heat to deposit itself. It's a function of the density and the reaction rate. Uh, competing with that as we try to make the plasma hot uh, Brems losses try to carry energy away. Because we are making a hot plasma next to a cold plasma, thermal conduction in the form of Spitzer conduction tends to carry the energy away, and they all have different dependencies on temperature, density, and, and radius, uh, or rho r. So the fundamental power balance equation that determines whether or not we are going to be successful is determined uh, by this equation on the upper right. So we have a heat capacity of dt times the time rate of change of temperature is just this balance of source, sources and sinks of energy. So we have the alpha heating term, the Brems term, the electron loss term, and then the primary way we get the plasma to heat up is actually through this PDV work. We're doing mechanical work as the implosion proceeds. So as we squeeze the implosion up, PDV work uh, is doing work on the hot spot that increases the temperature. We call that phase the implosion. Typically during this phase, we're achieving velocities of several hundreds kilometers per second. Uh, that's a, a, a typical uh, like high velocity projectile is, is under 10,000 uh, kilometers per second. So uh, it, this, is, this, is, this is, or 10 kilometers per second. So this is quite, quite fast. Um, and then, after the implosion reaches peak compression, it explodes. So this uh, source of heating, the PDV work term, that actually was beneficial uh, initially becomes actually another sink of energy uh, because it mechanically draws uh, energy out of the fusion plasma as this explosion proceeds. And that's one of the big differences uh, between a, an ICF plasma and a magnetic fusion plasma you usually don't have to worry about the magnetic fusion plasma exploding and uh, taking energy out in a mechanical form. Uh, as a result of this competition of these different physical processes of heating and cooling, uh, the nature of an implosion is that it's quite impulsive. So this is power in gigajoules uh, per second versus time. And again, what we're trying to do is maximize the alpha heating, which is this, this burst of uh, of uh, power here, 
uh, and it's driven by the PDB work that is uh, initially positive, but then turns negative, and it's competing with uh, the Brems losses, which is impulsive because uh, of the, the temperature and the density both responding to the impulsive nature of the implosion, and then you have the electron conduction loss term. So it's really a delicate balance between all these losses temporally uh, that we have to design or engineer to kind of get the conditions that we want. Okay, so what are the conditions we want? Well, some of the conditions we're trying to achieve or we have achieved is a burning plasma. And so let's define that in terms of this power balance. So a burning plasma, the statement is that the integral of the alpha heating power needs to exceed the external sources of heating. So for an ICF plasma, the only external source of heating is this PDV work. So the time integral of the PDV work has to be less uh, then the, the time integral of the alpha heating, and that defines a burning plasma for an ICF system. And this is an analog uh, to the magnetic fusion uh, statement of what a burning plasma is, taking, to, taking into account that an ICF plasma is impulsive, while a magnetic fusion plasma is more or less steady state. So in, in magnetic fusion language, this statement is most similar uh, to what is uh, called the Q alpha being greater than one. All right, so that's not the only state we're trying to achieve. Uh, we're also trying to get to ignition, uh, and this uh, statement of ignition is more or less made by Lawson. The physics is, in, in order to get the thermal instability that I described earlier, uh, the, the alpha heating must exceed all losses for a duration of time. So if we go back to our energy balance equation here of sources and sinks, if we can somehow engineer a situation where the Brems loss, the electron conduction loss, and the negative PDV work are essentially small compared to the alpha heating, you basically have a balance of the heating of the plasma with alpha heating that is finite time singular, uh, where the, the, the time rate of change of temperature increases as a function of temperature, and you get a rapid explosive increase in temperature that we call the thermonuclear instability, and that that is what we're calling ignition, and that is basically uh, Lawson's uh, definition. So it's a thermonuclear instability that causes a rapid increase in temperature if you engineer a situation where this can happen. And to engineer that situation, you need very high temperatures, a high rho r, uh, which is that aerial density of the, the plasma, and you need sufficient time. The reason why you need sufficient time is uh, because of this heat capacity here, it does take a little bit of time for this plasma to heat up and for that uh, finite time singular instability to take place. For us, it's uh, several tens of picoseconds. So that means we have to hold our implosion together for several tens of picoseconds to have a chance of this happening. And that's difficult because this implosion wants to blow itself apart. That, that's the nature of the implosions. But we can engineer that situation apparently. So to engineer this situation, we developed this uh, strategy that we call a hybrid strategy. And the challenge was that we, we, we need to increase our capsule scale, but keep the properties of the implosions that were working on earlier experiments, uh, such as the adiabat, which is a measure of the compressibility, the stability we had because uh, we're doing these rapid accelerations of, of materials, it has a tendency to be uh, Rayleigh-Taylor unstable, so that, that's a lot of work to control that. But we don't have time to go into that here. We need these high implosion velocities, just what we had before. We have this jargony term uh, called coast time. I'll explain that later. And we have to keep our implosion symmetric. Otherwise, we squander the kinetic energy that we put into it. And we have to do that with fixed laser energy because our facility has the energy it has. <laughs> and uh, so the strategy was that uh, back in 2018 or 2017, we had some pretty interesting implosions that were uh, producing uh, a, you know, a significant amount of alpha heating. We called these designs the HDC and Bigfoot design. Here are the lead people on those designs. And we wanted to basically just make that, that uh, system bigger or make the, uh, the fusion part of the system bigger by making the capsule bigger and absorbing uh, more energy into it, and also doing something that's kind of similar in, in a qualitative sense to what ITER is doing, 
uh, if you can change the volume to surface ratio of your plasma, which is you know one of the reasons I understand why weed eater is so big, uh, you can kind of tip the balance in favor of heating and a little uh, less in favor of cooling uh, because of the volume to surface ratio. And so that's essentially what we're trying to do here. Uh, the challenge of doing this is actually trying to control the symmetry of our implosions because as you make these uh, capsules large compared to the scale of the Hallram, it's actually becomes very, very difficult to control the symmetry. So you might get more energy in, but then you squander it with a, a symmetry. So we understood from that power balance equation uh, that I showed a few slides earlier, what the key parameters were to get the fusion yield to increase. And I'm gonna have to run through these quickly. Uh, you have the in-flight ablation pressure, which is related to the ablation pressure I talked about earlier, responds to the Hallram X-ray radiation temperature, uh, responds to velocity, uh, it responds negatively to asymmetry. It responds negatively to Rayleigh-Taylor instability and mixing, which increases the Brems losses. But for these implosions in 2017, 2018, we had ma basically maximized or uh, maximized our control on most of these terms. The two terms that we had not quite leveraged was the adiabat. But in previous experiments, we never had a good control of lowering the adiabat, trying to get more compression out of the fuel. So the last term that we really had leverage to try to uh, exploit was the scale. And there's a fairly rapid scaling there and that, that's basically what we did. As I said, uh, trying to do this, the main challenge was controlling symmetry. Uh, so uh, we, we had to increase the size of the capsule without demonstrating uh, damaging symmetry control. Our problem that we understood with controlling symmetry is illustrated by this cartoon on the right where we have this Hallram wall that we're blasting uh, the lasers towards. And we have sets of beams, uh, we call them outers, which are these steep angle beams and inners, which are our, our shallow uh, steep angle beams. And what was happening is the outer beams were hitting the inside of this plasma, causing a, uh, sorry, uh, inside of this Hallram wall, creating this plume of plasma. That plume of plasma would fly inwards and ingress into the interior of the hall room, and that would interfere with getting the inner laser beams where we needed them on the wall to control the symmetry of this capsule. And this, it took a while to understand that this was the physical process that was uh, challenging us, and uh, a, a nice model by Debbie Callahan and experiments by Joe Ralph basically demonstrated this. And we could then, once we understood this process, design around it, and that was done by Annie. Uh, so we used data-driven models to uh, re-engineer the design of the Hallram uh, to account for this. And we used something called uh, cross-beam energy transfer, which was actually utilizing a, uh, a laser plasma instability in a beneficial way by tuning the wavelengths between these different laser beams in this uh, plasma to swap energy from the inners to the outers to compensate for what's being scraped off. And you can see here, these are images of the hotspot of our implosion, uh, where if we, we didn't do this trick, we'd have a very oblate pancake-shaped implosion, which is not energy efficient, but we can eventually round it out. Okay, so uh, to... Uh, progress towards higher compression and higher temperature. We also had to uh, get an increase in the late time X-ray drive uh, to try to keep the, uh, the capsule from uh, decompressing prematurely. There's a whole nother story, uh, a physics story behind this. We have a jargony term that we use called coast time, uh, but it basically involves, we have to make the whole run more efficient to try to keep the energy that's injected by the lasers from leaking out in the form of X-rays prematurely. And uh, that, that story is illustrated here. Uh, what you see on the left is actually two different designs, uh, a design we had from about a year ago, and then a design uh, which created the burning plasmas that were reported recently in our, in our uh, nature papers uh, to a design uh, where we made small modifications and actually were able to cross uh, into igni an ignition regime back in August. You know, you'll probably look at this image on the left uh, and see no difference between these two different designs. And the, the design details are subtly different 
and it's uh, an illustration of how sensitive uh, these these uh, target designs are to uh, small changes. In addition to the design change on the geometry, which result, uh, which is basically a reduction of this laser entrance hole size and a repointing of these beams. There was a modification to the laser pulse that we request from the facility. We went from a high power uh, pulse that that shut off earlier to a lower power pulse that shut off later. But because of the changes to the, of the geometry of the target, we were able to increase the amount of X-ray drive latent time. And uh, this small difference where you could, it's almost imperceptible here in the geometry and only a non, uh, an expert would really see this difference in radiation temperature, you get an order of magnitude difference in fusion performance. So the benefits of this late time X-ray drive is really just increased hotspot temperature and pressure. The implosion responds very favorably to this. And it actually also has an influence on reducing uh, Rayleigh-Taylor instability, but that's a, another story. So, uh, as a result of making these design changes, we were able to uh, create uh, a state where we, we can actually get the alpha heating to far exceed the radiative loss and conduction loss. This is, these are, this is a plot of the integrated hotspot energies for this experiment, 210808 from last August, uh, as a function of time. You see this nature of this dynamic nature of the implosion in this plot of these energies. But again, the alpha heating is far exceeding uh, the conduction loss, the radiative loss, and the negative PDD work. And that allows us to bring this plasma to a state uh, that's quite interesting uh, in a fairly uh, symmetric form, as illustrated on the upper left. Uh, our simulations, at least uh, retroactively, are pretty good at predicting or postdicting uh, the conditions of our experiments. We, you know, can. Uh, can match the fusion yields, the temperatures, the, the densities, uh, the rho Rs, and these capsule gains uh, pretty much make sense with the, these models. And uh, so that's gonna be reported soon uh, in a paper we have uh, forthcoming. So uh, to, to measure these conditions, of course, our facility has quite a number of diagnostics that provide imaging data, neutron data, uh, spectroscopy data, and by using that data, we can inspect uh, the what's going on in our fusion plasma. Uh, the way we use that data primarily is to do this inference, which is key to determining whether or not we've really achieved a burning plasma or an igniting plasma or not. And uh, let me just run through this quickly. So uh, we know that fusion yield is basically related through a number to the density of the plasma squared, the reaction rate, the volume of the plasma, and the time at which the plasma is fusing. So from the diagnostic, from the neutron time of flight diagnostics on the facility, we can infer a temperature. We know the reaction rate for DT, so we can calculate this part of this equation. From the imaging data that we get in terms of neutron imaging and X-ray imaging, we can reconstruct the volume of the plasma that's uh, creating the fusion burn. So we can get a volume here from uh, the gamma ray pulse and or from uh, the X-ray duration, we can infer what the time of the plasma being hot is. And of course we measure the fusion yield. Therefore we can solve this equation for the properties of the fusion plasma that we're interested in, the density, the mass, the rho R pressure and hotspot energy, et cetera. So uh, using this, we can, we can infer all the key properties of the fusion, fusing plasma in the determine whether or not we have a burning plasma or if we've passed the Lawson criteria. So that's illustrated here. Uh, the Lawson criteria again is the statement that you have uh, now so much alpha heating that you're beating out all the, the losses in the plasma and you can get this uh, thermodynamic instability of temperature. And uh, while that statement is a single statement, there are many different formulations of that statement that uh, allow you to make this determination. And I'm showing a few, well, I'm showing about eight uh, different ones here. Uh, in terms of pressure of the hotspot, the radius, that's the criteria. Here are our old experiments. Here's our, our, uh, our recent one from August. This is the one that is maybe most familiar to people in magnetic fusion. It's the P-tau. Uh, versus temperature, 
that's a set of curves here, depending on how much uh, Brems loss you have. Here is our old data set. Here's the new experiment. And uh, people who work with implosions uh, generally like to work in the space of uh, rho R, yeah, hotspot aerial density and temperature. And there are a number of different curves here for this criteria from different authors. But again, you know, most of our past data is to the left of these curves and the recent experiment from August is to the right. So these different, these are all different formulations of the same loss and statement that have different assumptions and different mathematics behind them. Uh, but they're all basically saying the same thing that uh, prior to August, uh, we were not uh, igniting, although some of these uh, were burning. Uh, and then after August, uh, we have uh, passed uh, this loss and criteria. And again, this the, this uh, publication will be forthcoming. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, uh, what we see is, uh, uh, you know, our ICF effort has uh, was not as actually uh, easy as originally envisioned. But by by solving uh, little problems and steps in very incremental ways, we've actually uh, attained a significant advance in in fusion research. So our shots in 2020 and 2021 passed a burning plasma threshold for the first time. That's published recently in these uh, nature papers uh, that have uh, have come out uh, recently. Uh, in in uh, August, it was the first NIF shot to achieve a capsule gain greater than one, where the fusion energy is greater than the capsule energy absorbed. Actually, the the, the capsule gain was close to six. Uh, we now, from that August experiment, have passed several formulations of the Lawson criteria for ignition. Uh, the shot uh, achieved a target gain, though, uh, which is the fusion yield over laser energy of less than unity. And uh, the National Academy of Sciences in the US uh, in 1997, they defined that to be ignition because there wasn't agreement on what ignition was back then. So we don't pass that criteria. Uh, the recent experiments have uh, yet to, we've actually done repeat experiments, we've done, and they have yet to reproduce uh, the August uh, result. The best was about 50% of the performance, and that implies that we have less than ideal engineering control, which has always been a frustration. And as I illustrated earlier, you know, imperceptible or nearly imperceptible changes can be the difference between an order of magnitude of performance or not. So really tight engineering control is really needed to make this thing work reliably. Um, so we have efforts going on, on to increase fusion performance and robustness. And uh, But what is the final takeaway? What's nice about this is basically we, the fusion community, has an existence proof uh, that fusion ignition in the lab is possible, and uh, that should be good for everyone. So with that, I'll end. Uh, the images on the right are, are just from the uh, set of experiments on in August and the lead up to that, but I don't think we have time uh, to go into those. So, all right, with that, I'll end. Thanks, Omar. Amazing, amazing results. Okay, uh, we have lots of questions also for you. We'll get to them. Uh, finally, now, uh, please welcome Professor Dennis White, Director of uh, the MIT Plasma Science and Fusion Center. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation to come uh, uh, show our re results on this. Just to, excuse me for a few moments while the while it uh, while it uploads. I just as it's uploading, I just want to say thank you to all of my uh, colleagues at Commonwealth Fusion Systems, MIT's Plasma Science and Fusion Center, and our many collaborators. So the story here is is about achieving a technological breakthrough that has significant implications on the science. Um, an energy pathway for fusion, and may, namely achieving a 20 uh, Tesla, Tesla superconducting magnet. So the outline is I'll talk about why high magnetic field is so important for fusion science and energy. Um, then I'll go to um, the achievement of, uh, of a Revco superconducting fusion magnet above 20 Tesla. And then I'll describe what this it, it means for the spark high field burning plasma tokamak. So it's a, it's a great uh, follow on from, from Omar's presentation um, is that although we have slightly different, different definitions in the end, both magnetic and, and all, actually all kinds of fusion seek to meet the Lawson criterion, which is essentially a power balance that tells you about the internal heating going on versus the losses in this, in this plasma state. 
Um, so for magnetic fusion, we have the energy gain is determined by three parameters, the density, confinement, and temperature, which is shown in this standard plot, which I show over here on the right-hand side. And in fact, showing uh, a collection of data points that um, you know, is, is impressive that in fact, in magnetic fusion, we've gotten very close to QP of one, which is defined as the fusion power produced uh, divided by the heating power coupled to the plasma. So if you recall, again, from Omar's presentation, you saw a fifth of the fusion power heats the plasma because this comes from the alpha heating. So above QP of five, this is a clear definition in magnetic fusion because it's, in, uh, it's basically in equilibrium all the time. It's dominantly heated by its own fusion products. And this state is called the burning plasma. Uh, practical energy systems need QP of an order of 10 or greater uh, because of the conversion efficiencies. Um, and you can see from this plot, the tokamak concept has been leading, but hasn't got there yet about actually achieving a net energy gain from the system. So why is high magnetic field so important? So here's the sort of cartoon version. It basically comes from two pr principles. So one of them on the left is the Lorentz force, which for this is what is the, literally the force which is acting on the plasma fuel particles to, to, con to contain it. And the size of the gyro radius um, is dictated by uh, the temperature of the fuel and divide in the, in the denominator by the strength of the magnetic field B. Uh, but the plasma temperature uh, by that last plot is, is really almost a, a, a constant because it's really set by the nuclear uh, cross section. <clears throat> so what's important here is that at fusion conditions, this means the gyro radius decreases linearly with the size of the magnetic field. And if approximately you think of this as the volume goes like the cost and the other dimensions go like this, and it's a diffusive process to a linear process, yeah, this means the volume or cost scales very strongly nonlinearly with the inverse of strength of magnetic field. And on the right hand side, um, we basically considered about how stable the plasma is. So the, the plasma pressure is uh, exerting pressure that wants to, because it's out of thermodynamic equilibrium with the surrounding. The large magnetic field we use, particularly in tokamak, stabilizes against this. And because the fusion rate in the area that we're interested in goes like the plasma pressure squared and the magnetostatic pressure goes like the magnetic field squared, B squared, then in the end, the fusion rate per unit volume scales like the mag to B to the fourth. We can actually get a little bit more technical uh, on this and particularly for tokamaks, because it's usually defined uh, as the equations which are shown here, which is this is the so-called beta, which is the relative ratio of thermal pressure in the plasma to the, to the magnetic pressure. We know this actually quite well in tokamaks, this is so-called Troyon limit which actually has within it then other optimizations that have to do with the shaping of the plasma. Um, <clears throat> then we, we combine this with the fact that in the fusion uh, area that we're interested in around 10 keV, the fusion power density, that's the power per unit volume scales like the pressure squared, as I said before, this leads to generic considerations that the fusion power density, namely the amount of fusion power per unit volume uh, scales like B to the fourth power. This is the leading indicator for economics in fusion energy because it really tells you the uh, is the leading indicator of watts per dollar, and that's going to be uh, proportional to b to the fourth power. Um, confinement is a little messier than that, um, and this is actually from a uh, review talk that I gave uh, uh, several years ago. Uh, this is actually cast in the same way that Omar did it, but it's namely it's the product of the thermal pressure, which is the density and the temperature times the energy confinement time. As I showed you, thermal pressure scales at fixed physics, uh, like B squared. And then tau E has a ver variety of different, uh, often debated uh, dependencies on size and magnetic field, but it basically always is monotonically increasing with size, which is kind of makes intuitive sense. Large things can find things, their heat longer. And the strength of the magnetic field, because you're improving the insulation through the smaller gyre radius as you increase the magnetic field. There's a set of various ways we look at this, including stellarators, not even just tokamaks. And in the end, you come up with something that usually looks like this. It's kind of got R cubed-ish and B to some power, which is between four and six. So why is this important? Well, high field enables high gain because this is what the Lawson criterion determines is what gain that you get. And you can do this at lower cost because again, the dollars, if they're approximately at the volume of the device and there's, the, there's, there's a standard tokamak sitting there, that goes like R cubed, which is the linear size of the device. So this also scales like between B and four to the six. Okay, so that's what the um, that, that's what the physics tells us. So basically, fusion gain requires a minimum com combination of size and magnetic field on a tokamak. And fusion energy requires superconductors, 
because they must not lar con uh, uh, consume large amounts of electricity. So it's really in the end for, for, for power plants, for fusion energy, it's the limits of superconducting magnetic fields set the required cost and size. And the technology that was developed for ITER, which is circa 1990s, is niobium tin superconductors. This amounts to a peak magnetic field at the coil of around 12 Tesla, configured into a tokamak. This means the field at the plasma is just less than six Tesla. And if you look at the curves of size versus magnetic field, uh, this actually tells you why ITER basically is the size it is with a major radius uh, near, six, near six meters. Um, and it's really this technology is the far, far most important parameter that sets the linear size of this. If it was smaller uh, at this magnetic field, uh, it would not be able to access the, uh, the, the burning plasma state. And you can see the contours of gain. And so the, the thing is, is that if you can get access to higher magnetic field, then the linear size and therefore the volume of the, of the device would significantly go down. And so what happened was along came a, a new technology, uh, rare earth barium copper oxide, REBCO, often also called HTS because they're high temperature superconductors, really enable access to higher field. Here's some pictures over on the right, also very different physical form. Uh, basically in the, what makes a superconducting a superconducting state is a combination of three parameters of the temperature, usually near low cryogenic temperatures, strength of the magnetic field, and the current density, which is going in the superconductor. So the, uh, the, the low temperature superconducting technology lived very close to the axis of this, uh, and this is what, what set the limit of the magnetic field. The new Repco superconductor shown in the lighter shade region and essentially expands the operating space by about a factor of a thousand. So this is what you're really looking for as an engineer to be able to go after this. Um, so what is the features of, of HTS or REBCO? It's superconducting well above 4 Kelvin. Its critical surface has a very weak dependence on the magnetic field. <clears throat> so all this was th theoretically possible to greatly increase the magnetic field for fusion, but what are the practical limits? For example, the stress scales like the B squared because it's the magnetostatic pressure. What would be the stability of the coil? How would you cool it? And so forth. All the detailed engineering questions. But why were we motivated to do this? Well, we're motivated because opening up the right-hand side of that plot, which says that based on known established tokamak science, if we could access in the superconducting state a much larger magnetic field, then we'd be able to access actually quite large and, uh, and significant performance, including access to QP, uh, you know, an order of 10 uh, at much reduced size. Um, and that's what we required a peak field at the coil of order of, of 20 Tesla. And so what was the comparison of this? Well, in fact, uh, we, we know about this from experiments we'd run for a long time at MIT called the, the Alcator projects. And the last one was Alcator CMOD, uh, which actually established, for example, the world record for, for thermal pressure in the plasma, but it is a very compact device. It's only one cubic meter in plasma volume. So here we put into context, what does this mean in terms of a scale for the project is that I'll talk about spark and here's eater to scale. You can see them beside each other. They both achieve a, 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 an energy gain of order of 10. Um, oh, sorry, the fusion power should be 500 megawatts in eater. That was a typo, apologies, at a volume of 800 cubic meters. Um, and, and spark, which I'll describe later, uh, has high gain, large amounts of fusion power, but in a, about 1 40th the volume of eater based on the same physics as, as, as eater. Okay, so that was a clear motivation. So the good question was, can we actually do it? So a part of this was that we launched Commonwealth Fusion Systems out of, uh, out of, out of the Plasma Science and Fusion Center. This raised over $200 million to develop a greater than 20 Tesla Revco magnet um, and in an R&D partnership with, with, with uh, the Plasma Science and Fusion Center at MIT to enable this high field path. We pursued two pathways. So first of all, I'll show you is the so-called Viper cable. So this is a conductor and conduit using twisted stacks. This offers high uh, I cross B or Lorentz loading uh, tolerance, fiber optic quench detection, and we actually demonstrated nano ohm joints in this in the publications which are shown here. So and then this was developed for multiple spark applications, including our feeder cables, AC magnets, and it was a backup option for our large DC magnets because we didn't choose this. We actually chose another configuration which is so-called no, no insulation, no twist, or mint is our internal name for it. What is this? So this is based on single tape, non-insulating design that came from the, from the paper that you see there. Um, 
And what the idea of this is that the structural material of the magnet or the steel is in fact the insulator when the superconductor is active. This is because the superconductor has zero resistivity. So the current basically doesn't want to go into the steel or any structural material, even though at room temperature, it's a normal conductor, it essentially acts as an insulator. And one of the features of this, because it's a, the coil is an enormous electrical short, large voltages are, uh, are disallowed in it, and it offers a high degree of self-protection for basically the same reason. So what did we do? So we basically took multiple engineering and tactical decisions and formed our decision to use mint in the toroidal field of spark. So low voltage, well, actually here on the right, I'll just, why is this important? Well, the magnetic field is produced by the electric current going in the superconductor, which is going around. And then the idea is that you actually, even if something happens to the superconducting material, the current is allowed to internally redistribute uh, in, in this case, this is the sort of cartoon of think of a river, a, of a pebble going into a, a stream, and the stream kind of diverts around it rather than damming up and, and causing some bad things. So that damming up usually it, it looks like high voltage because that causes arcs and breakdown. Uh, this disallows it and basically enforces low voltage, which is this removes a common failure point and assembly difficulties of epoxy insulators in the system. It improves the prospects for, for self-protection because of the low voltage, simplifies operation criteria, and is then, then very robust to I, the Lorentz forces internal to the coil because you're getting rid of a weak uh, structural material, and you get also a larger choice of materials. And in the end, the normal, it also allow, allows normal joints are readily integrated because of the simplicity of, of the system. But its challenges would have required advanced electromagnetic models because the current path is self-determined inside of the coil, and then to do this, we, we built more than a dozen coils and tested them. So this didn't come overnight. So what did we do with the so-called TFMC, the toroidal field model coil of spark, was achieve the spark requirements with respect to, with respect to peak magnetic field, current density, and cooling power. Of course, there was aspects of this too, because we have, uh, this is in partnership with a, with a private company. We also did high temperature, the HTS supply and characterization. We came up with large scale vendors. We figured out how to build this, how to tool it. And in fact, very important about how to scale it, how to scale it to eventual large level productions that would be for commercial fusion uh, as well too. So what did it look like? Well, here it is. Um, it's around two meters uh, uh, tall um, and it has, it has the shape of what you think of for a fusion magnet with some modifications that came from the fact that it was a single coil that was being tested uh, at a time. But it was basically built to retire the risk for spark by recreating the conditions that would be seen by such a high temperature superconducting coil in the spark tokamak. So how was it done? So it was done again with no insulation. So it was machine steel radial plates with channels for the HTS and, and, the, and the cooling. The HTS is stacked into the grooves and is capped with copper. Then it's terminated at the internal pancake to pancake joints. And therefore the current was allowed to go from one pancake to the next. So it's a completely modularized um, um, fabrication and assembly process, which actually included in the end 16 independent magnets, which are independently QA'd, put together, uh, and so forth. And then in the end, we use a uh, VPI solder process, which was developed for the Viper cables to be able to, um, to have mechanical, electric, and thermal stability for the HTS. So in the end, as I said, this is completely modularized. These 16 independent pancakes were stacked together. They were internally jointed with, with normal conductors. Um, and, and then on the top and the bottom, we had current leads, which basically been the current in and out. Uh, and then it's contained within a, within a structural case to be able to uh, tolerate and translate the forces which are coming from the large I cross B forces. So what are the design features and what we were looking to do in this? So improved passive stability. It does not have, does not have an active quench tension system, unlike most superconducting magnets of large size. Intrinsically low voltage, less than one volt, um, high thermal stability, which means that it's robust to damage defects and off normal events. A, a key aspect of this, uh, an approximate is compared to low temperature superconductors, it's a hundred to a thousand times more thermally stable. This comes from an, uh, different combinations of the much higher te critical temperature in HTS, but also the much higher heat capacity of materials at the higher temperature. So it's actually a benefit to operate at high temperature. Um, we use a very simplified uh, and robust uh, cooling scheme using pressurized helium. We got away from liquid helium. Uh, and in the end, we came up with ways to have a very compact magnet and, and have very high current density 
which from Ampere's law is the way that you get high field in a small object. So what did it look like? So there was, again, there's a more of an engineering uh, cartoon of it. Uh, gaseous helium comes in the plena, which you see here, which are these two on that comes in and goes out the other end. The magnet is inserted like this. So it had 16 pancakes. The key one is that it operated near 20 Kelvin with supercritical uh, helium. It actually had I cross B forces on the order of 800 kilonewtons per meter and a very high winding pack current density about 100. And so it's 150 million amps per square meter. And we also built a new test facility at the plasma size infusion center. In fact, in, in the hall that used to contain the power supplies for the Alcator CMOD, which took the 50 kiloamps of current, brought it through the temperature transition, inserted it into the, into the magnet and all the assemblies that come along with it. So we also have now at the plasma size infusion center, a, an ability to test many generations and many um, uh, different variations, in fact, of this technology, because this is all uh, installed now at the Plasma Science Infusion Center. Um, so what did it look like? So you bring in current, it comes down, it has to make a transition from room temperature down to 20 Kelvin. This is done with some cleverness that actually uses soldered HTS to transition the temperature itself. So remember I told you about the two pathways. In the end, we actually used almost, we really used the technology of both pathways because the soldering process, the development of the Viper cable was actually used as the feeder cable into the magnet, as it will be in Spark. Um, and of course, Nint was used for the, to the for the toroidal field magnet in, 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 in general. So I can't go through all the details just because of, of time and others, but as order of 30 patents have been filed around this technology. And most importantly, it was all designed to be representative of Spark and to actually extrapolate eventually to commercial magnet production. So how did it do? Well, so the first test that we did, which I'll report here, which was really to get to 20. So the first time we tested it in an integrated way, we, we, we went to 20 tests. It went to the peak performance of what we decided was needed to verify the DC coil performance. Um, so what did we want? Uh, objectives that the design, could it actually, would the coil produce the design field and withstand the static loading? Uh, would the coil distribute the current as predicted? And we would get the, the by the same token, would we get the power dissipation that we thought would happen? As I told you, we we develop very complex 3D electromagnetic models. It's a very complex electromagnetic problem, very self-referential. This is actually the, uh, this was all planned beforehand, modeled with these. Uh, the, the, the test plan was such that this was ramped up, that we put current in, wait for the current to soak in, you would get the peak magnetic field and then go down, stress calculations, electromagnetics, performance of the superconductors and so forth. And we instrumented, instrumented the heck out of this thing, over 180 internal voltage taps, fiber optic current sensors, embedded all, all the things that you would do to in fact validate such a model. Um, so well, how did it go? Well, it went very well. So in September of 2021, the test confirmed essentially all the key DC predictions. So before I showed you on the bottom, this is the electromagnetic simulation. This is the actual experiment. It turned out we made a few tweaks in the in the test plan as we went along as we were measuring things in real time. Why is that? Because the charging time is on order of a day. So you actually have time to look at the data and, and, and figure out what's going on. Um, but in the end, we, we ramped up the current to order 40 kiloamps. And here you can see uh, at the HTS stack edge and at the HTS stack center, we, we, we went above the 20 Tesla objective and then, and then ramped the coil back down. So what did we verify? over 20 Tesla peak field, I cross B at over 800 kilonewtons per meter and a peak stress uh, over 900 megapascal with no visible signs or measured signs of, of changes or structural problems. The internal joints work very well at about a nano ohm. We verified charging voltage in time, had an excellent thermal and mechanical stability. We could see in, in some sense it was kind of a little bit boring from that, not, not always boring, but most of the time boring. And, and we really verified the simulated distributions of current and voltage, which were verified. So we verified low voltages also, and quench tests and other quench tests and optimizations are in progress now. So let me then conclude actually with uh, the spark high field burning plasma tokamak. So I'll bring up this slide again because again motivated about what we wanted to, to do was that the previous generation of superconductors could really in a tokamak this meant for the peak magnetic field at the plasma was order of around six uh, Tesla. Um, and what we showed in the, in, in the coil that I just showed you was uh, approximately doubling the magnetic field. In fact, the peak field in the largest part of the coil was, was, was near 21 or 23 Tesla. 
So, or sorry, 22 Tesla. So what this opened up was the right-hand side of this plot and uh, enables now uh, a spark, as I showed you before, which significantly reduces the size of the device by the, by the physics rules that I showed you at the beginning of the talk and the idea that we can, uh, we can actually get a burning plasma uh, at, a, at, a, at a very, very compact device. But it's even more than just gaining a burning plasma. And as I said, we, we, we launched Commonwealth Fusion Systems Spark is a net energy gain burning plasma, which is in the context of developing commercial fusion energy using the Revco magnets. And our plan was, uh, you know, understand high field fusion uh, confinement, which we largely did in Alcator, uh, complete the TFMC, which we did in September 5th. Then the company was able to raise $1.8 billion, which was announced uh, in December of 2021. And what, is, what, what did they raise these funds for? Well, it wasn't just to build Spark which the idea is coming in, in, in 2025 and build this compact device to, to achieve net energy de defined by QP, it was actually to go all the way to a commercial power system over here on the right called ARC, which we hope will uh, come online in the early uh, 2030s, uh, again, with this greatly reduced size because of the advent of the Rebco magnets. So what is Spark? Well, you know, our, in our, in our own uh, terminology, we think of this as the Kitty Hawk moment for commercial fusion. Um, so, what, what I'm, well, I'll get to what, what that means. So, so, what is so here it is. You can see the you can see the device. You can see the tokamak in its toroidal configuration. These are the toroidal field coils. It would be at the similar operating conditions as what I showed you to that, and you can see the people standing beside it. Um, so, it produces over 100 megawatts of fusion power at standard confinement uh, um, um, uh, conditions. And a plasma energy gain uh, just over 10, but at very compact size, an order of 20 cubic meters. So it's for those familiar, it's basically a D3D or ASLEX upgrade size total map. And it uses this breakthrough greater, greater than 20 Tesla Revco magnet required. And not just that, but the one that's required for ARC, not just for Spark in terms of the peak magnetic field. Yeah, so while providing the access to new science of the heated plasma. Yeah, but it's yet yeah, it's not trying to be a commercial device itself, and this is key about Spark. This is why we call it the Kitty Hawk moment. The Wright Flyer was not a commercial airliner. Neither does Spark try to do this, but it tries to prove that fusion, you know, can fly, quote unquote. Um, but yet at the same time, we are looking, you know, forward uh, collectively to try to use to use Spark to provide the economic basis to go far forward to Arc, but use yet a tactical approach. So it burns for order of ten seconds which equilibrates the plasma, but avoids the technology limits of active cooling, and it has a minimal tritium fuel inventory for, for licensing ease. And so why does this all work? Well, it works because of this simple plot I'm showing on the bottom right hand, which is Q and spark versus the field that you can get on coil. And again, as you know, the previous generation of superconductors, we're kind of stuck around 11 or 12 Tesla. This means that at such a dev size device, you would not be able to achieve uh, a gain greater than one. Uh, and you can see this is steeply nonlinear with the strength of the magnetic field at the coil. And this is the roughly where we obtained uh, the conditions. And so right now our prediction is a Q of around 11 in, in Spark at standard operating conditions. So where is it? Well, it's actually being built well, literally right now. It's about 45 minutes Northwest of Boston, fully funded by private sector investment. Here's the picture. The first be building being made is uh, very interesting, not offices, but actually the, the Rebco Magnet Factory. And this is being done by, by colleagues at Commonwealth Fusion Systems and the Spark Tokamak building being built over on the other side of it. And this, this is what the finished campus looks like over here. So the Spark design and operations are really are pushed by the needs to inform ARC. And here for details, please go look at the journal Plaza Physics Spark papers, which are free online. Um, here you can see the standard cross section for the plasma. And this looks at the, the standard set of things that we've talked about for a long time, because this is what we've talked about for the ETER mission as well too, which is confinement, particularly burning plasma physics, including the alpha interactions, because the plasma becomes dominantly heated by the fusion alpha particles. Uh, the, usual, the usual questions about to tokamak physics in terms of disruptions, fueling efficiency, and a very key one was heat removal via an X point uh, target diverter. I'll get back to that real quick, I'm running out of time. So that's just about done. So Spark, the other thing to remember is that Spark is solid, even though it's very small, because of this gyro radius business and the, D, in the, and the increase in the magnetic field, Spark is very solidly in the plasma physics experience of existing tokamaks. But of course, what it adds is the physics of self-heating. 
So this is the normalized confinement on the vertical axis. And what these are showing in the black points are the data set that comes from existing tokamaks in terms of normalized pressure, iron radius, collision, collision rate, magnetic winding, and, and the density limit. And the, and, the, and the big green point is where spark is, and the yellow triangle is where eater is. Uh, so we're basically using a common physics base as to eater as well. But even more so than eater, uh, at, for, particularly because of something called the density limit, uh, we're actually even more in the center of the of the set of data points uh, than, than that, which is a very which is very attractive and hopefully gives us high confidence about moving forward. And speaking of confidence, and links it back to Tony's great talk and the great results from Jet, is that part of this is very interesting. Jet is the largest tokamak right now, um, and it has the lowest row star. Uh, it actually has data points that have been taken. This is the is not the new results, but results from several years ago which we published and showed that in fact, the data points in the same database uh, pulled out from JET, which are red, are actually clustered very much around, around the Spark results. So we were very excited to see the JET results because this is confirmatory for tokamak physics in general as we go forward and, and hopefully we, we, get, we get solid results as we go forward with Spark. And in the end, Spark, because of its high field, actually has, has a very high range of burning plasma regimes that it can offer, which is directly relevant to ARC. And in particular, this comes from the ability, its ability to operate at a large variety of densities and still actually access fairly high gain. Uh, this is very important, not just to confinement physics, but also to boundary physics, where the, uh, this, this key parameter, uh, P sep B over Rn squared, tells you about the heat flux challenge and also the ability to be able to dissipate this. And this can be ordered, varied by over an order of magnitude in, in, in Spark and still maintain its, uh, it, its mission. Um, and this is, in fact, one of the interesting ones. I'll just pull out this one for is the high field path really enables high power density. This is the B to the fourth that I showed you before. But in a steady state power system, of course, you actually have to exhaust this power, which is a key part of going forward with the high field path. So Spark really provides early key insights to reactor class boundary plasmas with very high tolerance to exploring the options and the solutions. And why is this? Well, the empirical scalings predict very, you know, unmitigated, very high large amounts of heat flux. Yet the short pulse of spark at 10 seconds, even though it's a superconducting device, allows the design for survivability because it doesn't have internally activated components. So what we're going to do is we can use a core equilibrated plasma, and this will provide insights to arc solutions such as the advanced diverter topology that I'm showing on the right to be able to get to those answers. And in the end. The, and really, if, if people have seen you know, this over the, uh, the last few years, ARC and SPARC have been pulled closer together because we realized ARC itself is really the motivation you know, for SPARC. So we've been trying to answer more and more questions about ARC as we go forward. And this really means um, that, uh, uh, that, that the missions are becoming more similar to each other. So for example, our present um, idea is that ARC is, a, is, a, is an inductive device that is actually pulsed for a period of time, which scales basically from the spark device and very also important exploits an advanced diverter, which we believe will be tested and validated in, in spark itself. So in the end, I'll, I'll conclude there uh, and just uh, to note that um, uh, very exciting development, but they're really, the, in, in my mind, the development is, is you know, the, the development of the, of the new magnet is a very exciting one for us as fusion scientists because it gives us uh, new pathways to be able to explore fusion science, but in particular, the fact that it's uh, hopefully taking off time towards commercial fusion uh, so we can so we can use fusion as a new energy source. So thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Amazing. And uh, thank you all again. Um, well, this 90 minutes flew by. Uh, we have so maybe we if you can stop sharing, we go into, I don't know if you can, I, or I can probably take it over. Okay, let's have this, uh, let's get started with the- yeah, you, you, I, I don't know how to stop the sharing, so- I, please, I can take over. Uh, if you can do that, Mateo, great. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's get started. We have about 30 minutes and lots of questions. You all got more than five questions. I will start from Tony, then we go to Omar, and then I'll come back to you, Dennis. Uh, so, Tony, there's a question. Where do the new DT data fit on the curve of stored energy versus scaling? 
Yeah, I saw that one. Uh, well, that's a very good question, but I, I, I think it's a little bit premature to, to give already an answer. We need to uh, validate more data. So we're working on that and we hope to come out soon with a statement on that, but we cannot say yet. Okay. And I guess uh, likewise, uh, if the observer stop effect improvement is in agreement with the conventional scal uh, scaling law. Uh, yeah, that's similar. Yeah, we, we, we are really looking into that. Okay. Uh, for the jet DT, DT2 experiment, the erosion of tungsten by tritium is within tolerance. Could you, could erosion of tungsten by tritium be an issue for demo? Um, for demo is uh, also a little bit difficult to say. It's certainly not an issue for ITER. Uh, so we have seen that, uh, let's say for jet, it's, it's perfectly fine. Uh, ITER is using the same materials. We are still in the process of defining the materials for, for demo. Uh, so at this moment, we don't know exactly what, what first wall we are using. Also, I should state here, there's various demos. So I'm talking about the European demo. Uh, there's also K demo, Japanese demo, the CFTR. Um, also, our American friends have some ideas. So, um, yeah, we need to look into that. But uh, I think certainly for ITER, I would say it looks fine. Okay, and then there, there was this question, uh, but I think it was partially answered on the chat, just to bring it uh, here. Are the new DT discharges standard H modes or some improved advanced scenario? Uh, they, they're the hybrid uh, scenario. So we, we were looking uh, over the last years in the hybrid scenarios and the, and the baseline scenarios for ITER. Uh, these shots are in the in the hybrid scenario. In the baseline scenario, the, the results were slightly less good. We also had a limit in the length of our DT campaign, so we decided to focus on the hybrid scenario here. Okay, and then there was a question about the Q plasma achieved and it... Yeah, very good, I, did, I didn't mention that. So the Q of the 59 megajoule discharge is uh, 0.33, so basically one third. Um, this compares to a Q is uh, 0.2 of the 22 two megajoule uh, discharge uh, back in 1997. Uh, only for the uh, short blip of um, uh, 60 megajoule uh, during a fraction of a second, we had a Q of 0 0.6, 0 0.62 to be exact. Uh, but in, in general, you could say that the confinement is better than it was in uh, back in 1997. There's a question which just came in now. Uh, does the, the success from these experiments give us a chance to continue, continue running experiments with JET? Um, well, the idea with JAD is, uh, well, there's still a little bit of question mark, which we hope to answer in one or two weeks. So at the moment, we have agreement uh, to go on with JAD until the end of September this year. And this uh, includes uh, clean up discharges because we need, need to get the tritium out uh, and then helium discharges, which are very important for ITER. It's high priority there. Uh, we have a plan to continue chat until the end of 2023, and then around that time we will, um, uh, let's say, stop the machine. Um, it's a machine we started back in 1983 with the first discharges, so it's 40 years old. Um, what has happened with JAT is that we each time extended the life of JAT with, with, with one or two years. And uh, this is really uh, not a very good strategy uh, because in the end, each time when it's two years, there's a lot of maintenance you're not doing because you think, ah, it's another two years. So it's much better to extend a, a machine by 10 years because then you really can put power, uh, let's say effort in, in upgrading. So I, I would say uh, the end of 23 is a fairly sure uh, end. Um, there can be always one or two months, you know, uh, to finish some things, but I would say around that time we will wrap up chat. Okay, thanks, Tony. So let me uh, come back to Omar. Uh, there was this recurring question, which you actually answered uh, in your final slide. Uh, how, have you tried to reproduce the 1.3 megajoule shot? Uh, and you said uh, not yet, and that she reached 50% of the yield. I mean, you, you actually, you, you did reproduce it, I think about four, four times. We, uh, we tried the reproducibility experiments about four times and the best of those was about 50% of the record performance. Although all of those repeats were records compared to what we had a year ago. So they were still very high performance and they're kind of bridging this regime between where we were 
with burning plasmas and igniting. So they're, they're crossing that. The, uh, what we understood from those experiments is we observe retroactively that we have uh, the appearance of what's called a mode one asymmetry, which is essentially a drift of the implosion either off to the side or up and down. Uh, that basically steals kinetic energy uh, because of conservation of momentum and energy. You never get that energy back. And we also observe an enhancement in, in mixing, which we see uh, in Bremsstrahlung losses. And those are kind of distorting the energy balance in the hot spot that I talked about and degrading the performance. So we saw we can explain the degradation of most of those experiments after the fact why uh, the experiments decided to mix more or have mode one asymmetry is less clear. Usually the mode one asymmetry is associated with the manufacture of the capsule not being uniform thickness. It's thicker on one side and then, then on the other. You don't have perfect control of that or driven by uh, asymmetries in the laser not being perfectly symmetric in the drive. The enhanced mixing, uh, we do observe when the manufacture of these uh, targets, they're developed in a clean room by and large, but we've had an issue this last year with a lot of particulates showing up on the surface of the capsule, and that leads to deleterious hydrodynamics and the injection of high Z material into the hot region of the plasma and that tends to radiate. So we think we understand where some of these are, things are coming from, but we don't have the precise engineering control to just you know, get a clean target, get perfect laser delivery. And so those are our challenges we, uh, we still face. Uh, there was a question about the capsule, the, about the dimension, and uh, if you've tried other shapes of the capsule. Yeah, so uh, We've changed, obviously, the, one of the strategies we've had is you've changed the, the volume or the size of the capsule, the thickness of the capsule, making the, the capsules aspherical. Uh, there's something we call shimming, where you try to make it thicker in one region and thinner in the other in a way to engineer in uh, a compensation for asymmetries that might occur in the X-ray radiation field or other places. So that's been tried. Yeah. Uh, our best success, though, is with uh, the spherical capsules so far. Um, about open code to simulate uh, ICF other than multi, uh, is there anything? I didn't get that question. Open source code to simulate ICF other than multi, like any other open source code. Uh, <laughs> I think the University of Chicago has a code uh, that that has some of the physics in it that uh, is open source. Uh, I can't quite remember the name of it off the top of my head. Uh, uh, there was an interesting one about how do we meet the condition that the target must be shot into the chamber ten times a second. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Just to, to to give you an idea of how far away we are from that uh, conceptual inertial confinement fusion or I inertial fusion energy plant, you know, it takes us uh, essentially a week to set up one of these experiments, and uh, you know, it has to be very the target has to be very carefully positioned in the center of the target chamber, you know, uh, to to just you know, remarkable degrees of precision. We have to be within a third of a micron of, of or 30 microns of the center of the chamber. You know, this 10 meter chamber, we have to be in 30 microns. Otherwise, we'll get asymmetry. Uh, the other uh, issue is we have to keep trying to make that DT fuel layer on the inside of the capsule. So there's a whole team dedicated to that who keep trying over and over uh, to try to make it as perfect as possible. And again, it generally takes us a week to set one of these up. So that's a very long way <laughs> from from doing this 10 times a second. So, uh, um, so it's really just research at this point. It's... Thank you. Uh, there was a question about how do you control the LPI in, in optics system? And now someone just wrote, what's the biggest LPI in an ICF experiment? Yeah, so, you know, I'm not an expert on LPI, but our, our primary mitigation of LPI in the optics system is bandwidth, uh, where basically you have an incoherence in the the different frequencies uh, of, of the laser around kind of a mean frequency and that bandwidth tends to mitigate driving, you know, single LPI modes to some degree. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, someone. Maria got it. Thank you, Maria. I appreciate the flash code is uh, that was the name of it. She provided the link in the chat. Yes. Uh, so, uh, 
so that's our primary mitigation uh, in the optics. But again, I'm not an expert, so uh, you're stretching my knowledge base on LPI. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there was a question about fast ignition, and uh, the, your your opinion here. Uh, they're asking about the possibility of uh, realizing fast ignition without ultra short, ultra intense heating pulses. Well, yeah, so, uh, you know, fast ignition is interesting. There hasn't been nearly as much work on it as what we're doing, which we do hot spot ignition, where the compression of the fuel and the heating are done simultaneously. So uh, fast ignition is you try to do the compression of the fuel uh, separately from the heating. And so an ultra fast uh, laser or proton beams are the uh, proposed ways to get in the heating. My understanding is uh, so far, though, that getting that heat where you want it is been very problematic, regardless with the, the scheme. And, uh, you know, it's just Mother Nature does not like putting a lot of energy into a small volume. So uh, she will uh, fight you any way you can. But uh, maybe with research uh, that will uh, become more promising. Okay, one last one. What is the set of plasma relative to the all round? What what is what the size of the, of the plasma relative to the hull ROM? Yeah, okay. So the hull ROM is about a centimeter tall, and uh, it's about uh, 0.7 centimeters in diameter. Uh, the capsule, as I said before, we do the experiment is about two millimeters in diameter. It's crushed down, or the fusion plasma is crushed down to a diameter of a hundred microns. So it's a hundred microns over a centimeter, <laughs> it's, so it's a very tiny fraction of that volume. Uh, okay, thank you, Omar. Dennis, I come to you. I, I, I could see you were answering some of the questions, so I apologize if I'm asking some question which he already answered, but it was difficult to keep an eye on, on the chat. So there was a question about how much time is necessary to complete the TF coil for Spark, and then I think, uh, Someone else asked, is 20 Tesla approaching some technology or functional limit? I'm sorry, what was the first question? How long? To... How, much, how much time to build the, the TF coil for Spark? The, the model coil that we did, or that maybe was what I don't understand. So that, that took uh, I around... think maybe if you could, if, we, if oh, you could. Coil, right, yeah. So the test coil itself took, um, it was just under a year to actually assemble it. Uh, of course, first of a kind. Um, uh, I mean, a, a, an anecdote to that very important one, which was that uh, the, the very first, as I pointed, it, it was actually made by separate, it was made of separate coils. Not too surprisingly in technology, the first one took us uh, a couple months to make. By the, by the end of the process, we were we were making the, the pancakes uh, at a much faster rate, uh, sort of more like a few weeks and so forth. So this is what actually extrapolates to when CFS as uh, is an interesting one because we, we built that mostly at MIT, but now it's actually going into the hands of Commonwealth Fusion Systems because it's becoming more of a, a commercial endeavor. So they are now building the capability out at the site that I uh, showed the photo of. Um, and then the idea is that that scales up to production capacity that 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 hits the hits the the timeline that we that, that we talked about for the TFs in in Spark. Which is this order of eighteen uh, TFs in Spark, and is the twenty Tesla some functional limit? No, no. Actually, it was an interesting one that twenty Teslas uh, in uh, was uh, was was key based on the the confinement you know physics and stability physics that I showed before. But twenty Tesla itself has no um, didn't seem to have any particular threshold that went that went by it. Um, and that, that that affected the 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 high temperature superconductors or the structural materials. At some point, you will hit a limit, and the limit in that the problem. My my guess is that the limit in that design would have been the structural uh, uh, stresses in it. There were some things that we had to do to the geometry because it was a single coil to be able to concentrate the field in particular reasons so that 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 volume was at the representative ones for spark. Um, and, you know, we were around 900 megapascal of von Mises stresses. That's, that's 9,000 atmospheres in steady state on a, on a structural material. That, that's significant, you know, but the, we didn't seem to hit, we did not hit any thermal dissipation limit, nor could we extrapolate one. Um, 
or power limit. Um, it, it looked quite good. Um, yeah, it, it probably, I'll, I'll guess here, probably could have gone through around 22 Tesla would, would be my guess. But okay. we, once we hit the limit, we, we stopped there. <laughs> um, what is, the, I think you answered this one on the chat. Uh, what is the expected behavior of the HTS under high neutron fluence? And then someone asking also about uh, disruption. Uh, if you, yeah. you... Uh, actually, I didn't interest, a, a, answer that one. So Spark, uh, this is one of the other tactical, tactical advantages of, even though we're building a superconducting device, we're operating it for order of 10 second pulses, you know, five to 10 seconds, much like the one, the jet one that, that Tony showed. Uh, this limits the fluence of neutrons to the, to, to the toroidal field coil so that we will not hit any, in Spark, we will not hit any limitations because of the neutron damage uh, on the high temperature superconductors in the magnet. Uh, that is not the case, of course, for ARC, where it'll have large fluence because it'll be operating more semi-continuously. Um, so we have an active research uh, program underway to much better quantify the, 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 um, the, the, the damage caused by neutrons uh, on, on the high temperature superconductors. We have a rough idea of what that is. And knowing what that number is uh, with a high level of fidelity is key to designing, because it was related to the other question, what about like the neutron mean free path? Yes, that's exactly. <laughs> so so the, these take off uh, centimeters in the arc design and these things matter because it really affects the economics. Yeah. There were lots of questions, I think, about arc uh, design indeed, uh, about power exhaust solution uh, and what would be the tritium breathing blanket made of. And then I saw you were on the chat, you were talking also about the RF eating do you want to elaborate on this? So Spark will use ion cyclotron range of frequency heating only. Uh, this is a robust technique uh, that was demonstrated on high field compact, high density plasmas like the Alcator, uh, like the Alcator experiments. Uh, Tony can comment. I'm pretty sure you used ICRF in your jet in your jet record jet results as well too. So you know, yeah, exactly. So it, it's a no one, and, and it avoids particularly in the compact devices the challenges of neutral beams, which don't penetrate very well because of the, because of the high density. Um, uh, so that's going to be for Spark, um, and it's around 25 megawatts of installed heating power. In the scenario that I mentioned with the Q of, of 10, it'll be around uh, 11 or 12 megawatts of coupled heating power. In Arc, we'll almost certainly use ICRF again. Uh, we are pursuing. Um, aspects of looking at inside launch lower hybrid for arc for improved even even if it's not non inductive to help with the uh, flux consumption but um, you know that's that's open at this point but RF only yeah. um, there was a question about spark not having the mountable joints but arc was planned to have the mountable joints is the TF technology demonstrated in the model coil appropriate to a TF coil with the mountable joints yeah so it's, it's a good question so uh, the um, right so we're we're looking at different options for about the jointing in, in arc it's it, it's a challenging geometric and design problem and there, there's some papers going to be coming out on that fairly soon um, what we did in the TFM, what we did in Spark doesn't require it because it's got a, a, a low fluence mission, so we don't actually need to. Um, we don't we don't hit any fluence uh, limits for the interior materials, so we decided not to use that to simplify it and work in parallel on the jointing. But in the TFMC itself, it featured seventeen um, uh, joints, which have a similar, but which have a commonality in their internal design. To what we would think of what we would use in arc and namely that it's essentially allows the transition from the one set of superconducting uh, high temperature tapes to another one through a normal joint um, and we were able to test that uh, in a variety of conditions including large stresses very high magnetic field very high current densities and they passed with flying colors at this point i mean it was uh, we, we we established they were all around a nano ohm and resistivity and, and very stable. So we feel fairly confident that we've we've um, we've we've validated the basic physical concept of using a, a joints um, because that's really the, the key thing is what kind of resistance you can get in each joint. But we have to work more on the details of how you'd actually implement that in a larger coil. But it's fully disassembled, uh, disassemblable 
in a in, in the TFMC. So you can take it, put it together, and take it back all apart again, which is another key uh, aspect to me of of having uh, a viable solution going forward for maintenance, uh, not just for maintenance, but also for for assembly. Really key. There is a question about what are the main limitations on pass duration. I think uh, both you and uh, Tony explained that, but maybe we can, if you want to say a few more words, and maybe we can hear from Tony again on why the Jet Tokamak operates for those seconds. Yeah, in, in, in Spark, it, it was a, um, uh, it, it comes from several things. So one of them is an administrative limit on the amount of energy that's allowed to be uh, dissipated in the coil from the fusion uh, neutrons. Um, uh, the other part, but, you know, really it's a physics one because it's exactly to what Tony said is that it turns out that the, the inter there's a long time scale. The 2 longest time scales are the energy confinement time and the current relaxation time uh, of the distribution. Uh, and in these, in these classes of devices, these tend to be several seconds. So, once you waited like 5 or 10 seconds to the plasma, it's eternity. I mean, it's, it's in equilibrium. So. Holding it on for longer than that just adds in more engineering complexity, but you're not really gaining a lot of insight as to the equilibrium of, of the plasma. Yeah, I agree. Uh, well, basically a jet is basically the copper coils, which, which are a heated. Yeah. It's not the only effect. It's also the heat loads on the diverters. So slowly uh, the diverter heats up because the one in jet is uh, also inertially cool. We don't have act active cooling there. And that time limit is a little longer than that from the coils, but then still it limits us to maybe maybe that will limit us to seven or ten seconds or something like that. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Omar, there's a question for you about the degree RTI and the 1.3 megajoule shot. Is the is RTI still one of the biggest issue? And then I don't know if you answered this on the chat, but they were asking. Uh, to comment on the path forward for NIF. Um, and if you're going to, yeah, how the underlying physics and uh, burning ignited plasma will be useful for, yes. for the ICF community and uh, for the MFE community. Sure. So uh, let me do this two, two questions. And so the RTI, the Rayleigh Taylor instability, that is a constant challenge. Uh, we learned, you know, about eight years ago how to manage it by uh, changing the laser pulse in our implosions uh, to mitigate it to a degree. And we've essentially been using that same tactic uh, for the, you know, the subsequent eight years. So, hold on, excuse me. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the compromise we made or the, the trade-off we made in managing the Rayleigh-Taylor instability uh, comes through reducing the potential maximum theoretical compression of our implosions, uh, which the practical result of that is there, our implosions will be limited in the amount of gain that they could produce until we, we get some sort of other technique to uh, manage really Taylor instability control without uh, uh, having the trade off uh, compression. Uh, so, uh, it's a constant challenge, but we manage it. Okay, so now to the second question about the path forward. Uh, uh, our path forward involves uh, increasing the robustness of our implosions. Uh, part of that is improving the engineering side, so we get improvements in the laser beam balance and uh, you know uh, better quality targets to the degree that is realistic. Uh, and then altering the design the best we can to make it even more robust. Now, there's a limit to how well we can do that uh, because uh, there's a trade off between um, the energy that the facility can provide and, and robustness. So, if we had more energy available on the facility and we're able to deliver more energy to the implosion, that relaxes uh, some of these uh, extremely high pressures and densities uh, that we have to reach, achieve. But as long as we are energy limited, uh, it's sort of inevitable that uh, we're going to be sensitive, uh, have a very sensitive uh, implosion. So uh, then we're also trying to increase increase the fusion performance uh, and just see how far we can go. Uh, some of that might just involve playing the same tricks of making the implosion larger and larger. 
now that we've uh, better learned how to manage the uh, symmetry control with that, uh, looking at thicker uh, uh, shell implosions uh, and, you know, alternate uh, Horam designs and so forth. So there's a, a myriad of, of different uh, options that will allow us to kind of build on this result, but we're trying to do it in steps because as I tried to illustrate in my talk, you know, these implosions because of their small scale are very sensitive. So you don't want to take too big of a step and get kind of lost in the desert. Uh, uh, and lose contact with what you know works. So, thanks, Omar. Dennis, there were plenty of questions on uh, Spark Arc. I'm not sure I I could see all of them. I, I'm, I'm typing as fast as I can. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna pick this too because they were they were reachable. They they're, they're down on the chat, and I can see them easily. There, there's a question on if Arc will require active cooling of the first wall and diverter as compared to Spark. Yes. Yes, and then yeah, so um, because it, it right because arc goes to uh, because of its increase in size and uh, higher temperature and decreased flux consumption, all these things. Basically, we look now at around like a thirty minute kind of uh, pulse length for for arc or something like or, or approximately something like that. So you're so far past now the the thermal equilibration time. You have to have actively cooled internal components. This is the this is one of the the secrets of actually keeping pulse lengths below five or 10 seconds, you can use inertially cool, you know, objects because, yeah, you just got enough thermal inertia in them. Yeah. And the uh, two weeks long process for the uh, cooling down the structure of the 20 Tesla magnet, can this be reduced? Can time, can this time be reduced? Yes. Yes. So it, it can be to a limit. So we were very cautious just because we were, um, you know, it was very new and we were also testing out a new cooling capability, which was the supercritical helium. Um, so we are fairly cautious. So there are ways that you can reduce this, but in the end, there's a limit. It's basically the cooling capacity and the, and the, and the total thermal energy content of the, of the coil and the surrounding medium. So, um, you know, probably for that class of, of magnets, it's, it's going to be hard for not to be many days basically to cool down. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Dennis. So we we also heard from you what's happening with Spark and then Arc. We heard from NIF and uh, also the path forward. Tony, there's a question now for you. Uh, what will be fusion research focusing on after Jet and Ether will stop will start operation? So JT six CSA. If you could say a few words about what what is going to happen in the next future. Well, in the next future, it will be very exciting. Um, so, indeed, JT60 comes in operation in the course of this year, uh, but first physics operation is more for 20, uh, 324, uh, 24 actually. Um, we, uh, what is very exciting is then in the course of this year, Wendelstein 7X comes uh, back in operation. It's a stellarator, and where we equip now the stellarator with actively cooled diverters, so we can go to high power and 30 minute discharges. So this is really exciting. Uh, we are working on other devices in Europe. We are uh, at the same time uh, in the coming six, seven years, completing the design of demo, the European demo, which would uh, come after ITER. So it's a very exciting time. Uh, we, we have um, uh, pretty much on our, our uh, task list, to do list, uh, we're working very hard. So it's it's a great time to work in fusion at the moment. And on this uh, topic, there was a question about someone interested in uh, studying fusion and how to get involved and participate in fusion R and D. So if you could all share some guidance and uh, on how to engage and. Well, there's so many laboratories. It depends. I, I I don't know whether the person is completely outsider or still doing a study. Yeah. Of course, they were working as a mechanical uh, engineer. Oh uh, yeah. Well, I I think there's many laboratories. Uh, I I don't know where the person is based, uh, but um, if he looks to the Eurofusion website, uh, Eurofusion.org, uh, we have the list of all our member institutes, and I, I would recommend that person to contact the the members uh, institute in his or her country and uh, uh, then see what is possible. I think we really need, you know, we, we recently made a movie in Eurofusion called We Need Your 20 Watts because our human brain works on 20 watts 
uh, we, meet, we need many of these 20 watts together to make fusion work and to realize uh, electricity from fusion. And I'll just point out my, my colleague, uh, Amanda Hubbard said, we, we are now hiring mechanical engineers at the, at the Plaza Science Institution Center yeah. as well too. So please take a look around. Um, I agree with Tony, it's, an, it's, an ex, it's a very exciting time in, in fusion right now. And in the end, we, the way I look at it, we need, it, it's a field that has been dominated by people like myself, Tony and Omar, who are really at our heart Plaza, plaza scientists. But it, it, you, you can see that the, the breadth of the kinds of talents that are going to be needed to carry out these, these next generation of devices and eventual power plants is greatly expanded past, past plasmas. Um, and that's really where we're going to, we're going to need more talent. Mm -hmm. Omar, do you want to add anything on ICF? <laughs> It's just going to suggest finding a venture capitalist, but uh, <laughs> good one, Omar. <laughs> Actually, we are hiring uh, prolifically. So there's a if if you're interested in the ICF side, with the understanding, you know that a lot of what we do is national security related. Uh, please apply to Livermore. Uh, there are a number of openings available uh, presently. So. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. We're almost four. We're only four minutes late. We can close, and uh, we'll 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 have a second episode uh, perhaps in June. Or we're fixing the date, and uh, I can announce that will be East Results feature. Then uh, a few more uh, a few more devices laboratories. So thank you all. Thank thanks the speaker uh, speakers, and uh, see you next time. Thank you, Matteo. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank session. you, thanks. especially thanks. for all the uh, participants. Yes, thanks, Tony. Um, thanks thank thank for setting this up. Yeah. See you. Bye. Goodbye.